good evening uh, sorry there was a technical difficulty uh, a very warm welcome to i'm dr vidya the organizing secretary for this event on behalf of the department of microbiology at the raj college for women i welcome you all to the webinar series on exploring and understanding world pandemics we will start the session in few seconds So before we start the session, I wish to share a few words about our college and the department. Uh, Itraj College for Women was founded by the Emin Barrister, the great visionary Thiruvi L. Itraj in 1948. This autonomous institution is affiliated to the University of Madras and it's re-accredited with A grade. It also has received the title College with Potential for Excellence. Our college has achieved magnificence in providing variety of courses. eminent faculty members and sophisticated infrastructure apart from excelling in academic and research field our college encourages extension activities and outreach programs eventually our college had adopted two villages namely namely cherry and karnataram cherry and the work for the upliftment upliftment of the same the department of uh, microbiology was inaugurated in 1997 and was upgraded as a post graduate department in 2006 we have received the affiliation for mphil microbiology this year and the course will commence in the next academic year our department provides well furnished classrooms and fully equipped laboratories besides academic and research excellence the student placement record stands high in the in both on campus and off campus interviews the department is headed by dr k krishna prema dean of research associate professor and head and also the convener for this event now moving to the session a few instructions to the participants kindly mute your audio uh, until the session ends if you wish to ask any questions to the speaker you can post your question in zoom chat or uh, youtube live chat and uh, uh, to crisply say about our webinar series this is to enlighten the fact findings and insights of pandemics for the past present and future so uh, in few session in few seconds the uh, speaker will start the session so uh, day one our speaker for this session is uh, dr gauri shankar raju associate principal scientist global ppdm mark and co usa uh, dr gauri shankar raju has more than 14 years of teaching experience in microbiology and immunology and has guided over 70 students he has presented and published over 100 research articles and co-authored four lab manuals he has filed five patent applications from cdc atlanta At present, he is leading a team of researchers at the Merck Research Laboratories, Pennsylvania, pursuing research and vaccine development and evaluation of pathogens of global public health interest. His topic is COVID-19 biology of pandemics. In a few seconds, the speaker will take over the session. Hey, Vidya. Thank you, sir. Sorry, sure. there was a small technical difficulty. Please take no over worries. the session. No worries. Yeah. So, can I can I share my screen now? Yes, sir. Wonderful. And can you all see my screen? Can you see my screen? Yes, sir. it's going to start. Yes, sir. We could see. Um, wonderful. Okay, thank you, um, 
Uh, I should. Uh, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Prema and uh, Vidya and Reena for uh, this unique opportunity. Can you all hear me, Vidya? Can you confirm that you can hear me? Yes, sir. It's hard, sir. Good. <clears throat> uh, yeah, this is a very interesting, very different, very unique experience to me. Number two, of course, take two. I had the opportunity to just like do the webinar a couple of weeks back in another institution. That was a very, very unique opportunity and uh, that seems to continue. Um, I, You all know, I think most of you have, would have uh, just like come in uh, contact with me one way or other, either you would have been my direct students or I would have had the opportunity to just go over to your uh, schools and like uh, uh, deliver uh, lectures in the past few years. Hence, like, you know exactly like who, I'm, who am I and uh, you know my style. I'm, I'm a, I'm, I usually allow, I'm a very traditional classroom teacher, even though I just, I have, I have been teaching only for masters uh, in microbiology, but still I strongly believe I'm a, I'm a sort of a very, very orthodox teacher, love to just go to the back, love to just make my hand dirty with the chuck peas. And uh, of course I had, I had also grew up like grown up. Like whether like grown up to uh, like, like uh, uh, PowerPoint presentation, but still I love the uh, blackboard. Love to just walk around the participants because like participants, every participant brings in so much of energy and enthusiasm. That's exactly where we draw our uh, we just draw our uh, energy. So I draw my energy and uh, uh, like uh, uh, drive from the uh, participants. So that part is missing. Of course, like now I'm just talking to my, it's almost like I'm talking to myself. Um, it is it is a very different experience, but like I do believe like at the end of the day, like uh, the, the uh, message is like a message is delivered. The information is like shared and uh, uh, that's exactly what is the like a point of this discussion, isn't it? So in that way, I'm okay. I'm just sort of, uh, I'm getting more and more, I'm getting um, to be a believer of this uh, long distance webinar uh, uh, webinar uh, discussions. Um, would I be completely transformed into this? I may not, but like, hey, COVID is basically forcing us to do this. Um, couple of disclaimers. It is like, you know very well, by no means, this is going to be exhaustive. This is going, this is going to be, this is very exhaustive. So no means I may be able to just, I will be able to give you all the informations at least to a certain aspects of uh, like COVID, because it is a sort of a really an exploding way, exploding world of research as far as uh, this COVID nineteen is concerned. And you all, you all have tremendous access to the information. Like just ask ask Google God, it'll give you everything. So it is going to be there is going to be a lot of redundancy. Uh, I try to navigate from the, around that to make sure, like I try to just keep the information a little more interesting, little more up to date, little more uh, like of a different angles, but still like today I understand, today at this point I understand what challenge you faculty face while teaching your students. See in my days when I was teaching my teaching, I had the unique advantage because, advantage because the technology was not that much evolved at the time. Hence, I have the like only access to information is the, like the, the textbooks. So if it is going to be, if, and, and we know very well, like at that time, based on the student's profile, like if it is a biochemistry, then students, are, I don't think students will be encouraged to just like a touch uh, a Leninger or, or a Leninger or, um, or, or, or uh, Stryer. So they may just do it. They may just uh, you read Conan and stuff and move on. Hence, if, when we just prepare our class from away with Leninger, obviously we are going to provide some new information which keeps them, keeps their interest alive. Same thing with, say, for example, if it is if it is physiology, will be they will most probably students will be just like go confine themselves to either Pelzar or uh, Stanier, Stanier, where when we just like uh, dive into a uh, Moss or Mott or uh, Ross, obviously, a lot of information is going to be new to them that will keep their interest alive. But unfortunately, now, like, the information is out here, so we are going to I am going to dip into the same pot which you all do, will be dipping your hand. So most probably, it's like I just believe. Like every time I dip in, dip, I just, I just like believe or hope that I just get some, some different, uh, different uh, flavor of the elixir than you. That's my hope. So you, so the disclaimer is, 
if there is, if there is a lot of redundancy, can't help it. So that's exactly how, how, how it's going to be. With this, uh, like a brief introduction, uh, let me just go on with the COVID-19. Um, of course, like the topic is going to be is actually biology of the pandemic. So a quick flavor on what exactly this pandemic. This is like basically epidemiology 101, where like depends upon the um, intensity and the, uh, the exhaustive nature of the uh, of distribution of the disease. Uh, disease has, is, is, is being like, it has been like uh, defined or, or being categorized into different categories. For example, endemic. You know very well that if a disease is confined to a community, it is usually, it is, it is labeled as endemic. Classical example of endemic in India is actually filariasis, where it is pretty much endemic, uh, pretty much confined to coastal communities in India. You know, like for example, Pondicherry has been uh, like an endemic for filariasis for a long time. And I believe recently it's been like, they have just they lifted the uh, endemic status, not as a great status, endemic, uh, endemic uh, stigma of uh, filariasis from uh, Pondicherry. So Pondicherry technically is no longer uh, like a, like a filariasis uh, endemic. So we all go to Pondicherry for various purpose. Now we can go with, uh, with all the more comfort that we are not in the risk. Uh, again, within the endemic, when which is where a disease is confined to a community, it again it is, it is like it depends upon the spread or the frequency or the, the, um, the, the persistence. It is again further there like a demarked into a, either sporadic endemic or hyperendemic. For example, a classical example of sporadic endemic is I would say polio. Technically, polio is like technically India is out of uh, out of uh, polio map. Earlier, like few years back, till I think maybe till 2014 or 2015, there were four countries. That's why they're called it's called as pain countries, like Pakistan, Afghanistan, India, and Nigeria. These are the four countries which are actually the polio polio plus countries. They they were they were the one which actually had the polio disease burden. But I think in uh, 20, 2015 or so, we, I think polio was eradicated from India. Technically, polio was eradicated from India. It's so it's no longer pain. It is going is only pan. Still, you do. I think when you when you look at the you look at the newspapers once in a while, sporadic sporadically, you there could there there are incidents of uh, polio in um, in, in uh, some kind some uh, some cities or some places. That's why it's not exactly endemic, but it is sporadic. But there could be hyperendemic, like it is endemic, but it is almost like a, like almost like an epidemic because it is all over the place. But still, it is confined to, like within India, for example, malaria. You could see that some some states, some cities, it is it is really really endemic, hyperendemic. The incidence is very high, whereas some cities it is very low, like Sikkim, Lakshadweep. It's a the, the, the disease burden is very low. Hence, even the endemic, even though it is confined to a community depends upon the disease burden, it can be, it, it is actually, it is differentiated into either hyperendemic or sporadic. Epidemic, of course, next, like epidemic is, there is a very fine, thin line that separates endemic and epidemic. Epidemic, I think my take on this basically is like, pretty much epidemic is pretty much endemic. Only thing is that disease burden is much phenomenal, much higher than endemic. So for example, dengue is a classical example where the disease burden is like very well, very well spread across the country, but like it is pretty much endemic to some countries. Hence, it is we no longer call it as endemic, but we just sort of we just we have promoted dengue as an epidemic. When this disease burden, when the disease basically spreads across the countries, across the continents, impacts several hundred, several thousand people, then basically. It basically, it, it just becomes pandemic. It gets upgraded as pandemic. Classical example of recent pandemics are SARS, MERS, Ebola, and our COVID. It's a, it's a true pandemic that is now, now just basically like creating a havoc to the human, uh, human, uh, human life. Hopefully we'll, we'll just get over it. Okay, so what is COVID? See, just a little bit of little bit of history of uh, COVID-19. So in December, December 2019, I believe like in the Wuhan city, like they just observed a cluster of pneumonia cases. They just like, they just realized that it is a novel beta, 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 beta coronavirus. So initially it was named as 2019 NCOV. 
because it originated from Wuhan, then they just basically like, oh, maybe we can just like, we can get the, take the credit in one way, in a negative connotation. We say like, okay, we can take a credit as Wuhan coronavirus. After we just got the genome in, uh, in, uh, in January 2020, it was realized that this coronavirus has got almost 80% homology to SARS -CoV SARS virus. Hence, it was basically named as SARS CoV 2. And the disease caused by SARS CoV 2, it is called COVID 19. Of course, like, like how exactly this has been, this is the, the, this endemic, which is supposed to be endemic in Wuhan, how exactly based because of its spread, WHO basically in January, they just upgraded this as a global public health emergency. And in, on, uh, in uh, 11th, mid March, it was upgraded as pandemic because it spread much wider, wider, wider across uh, the globe. So what exactly the main source of this virus? It was, it was as of now, let me just tell you, as of now, based on the, based on the information available in the open source, based on the peer reviewed articles, the source is pretty much the Hunan seafood wholesale market. It's a wet market, so everything is live. People drive the, there and when they're there, they just process the, process the meat and material. So while you're processing it, obviously, if there is going to be an Arab, if there's going to be a pathogen available with the, with the potential to be an airborne uh, pathogen, there you go. When you just like, a, you, like when you just like operate, when you just like butcher the animals, everything just like it comes through the air, they breathe it, customer breathes it, well, they just buy the meat, pay the money, but buy the virus without paying the money. They just bring it out. That's exactly how one possibility how the Hunan seafood the wholesale market has uh, been a uh, ground zero for this uh, virus. It's it's ticking. It, it is like it's ongoing, right? You can just see the disease burden as of now. It is almost like more than 4 million people are affected uh, like globally with almost like a 200 or 300,000 deaths. US has been, as you know, US has a very high disease burden, more than one and a half million uh, uh, the disease uh, diseased with almost like uh, eighty thousand uh, fatality. India, I don't I don't want to get into politics, but like India, I could see that even though we have three times the population of states, for some reason we don't our, our disease burden is very very low as of now, only around sixty eight to seventy thousand with around like two thousand uh, fatalities. But you don't know, and uh, you are the best judge whether how how realistic is this. Or can we be very comfortable? Oh, no big deal. We are just in a good, good, uh, good shape. I don't know. You are the best judge because you are the uh, local ambassadors of science there. But this is really a truly a pandemic. So let us take a quick look at this, uh, at this, bio, at this uh, virus, SARS-CoV-2. I'm sure every one of you would have seen this picture in one way or other, like a, like a pincushion uh, structure where it has got a sort of a positive sense, uh, like a RNA, it's a RNA virus, it's got a positive sense RNA, nicely covered with the nuclear capsid, so that like the RNA has been like, it says it is safeguarded very well, has got an envelope, it's an enveloped virus, so it's got an enveloped protein, then it has got a, it has got a lipid uh, bilayer membrane, so it has got spike protein, a membrane protein and envelope protein. All of them, when they exposed, they can be immunogenic, but the real hero here is spike protein because Spike protein is the one that is going to actually recognize and sort of bind, bind to a like a receptor in the host cell. A little more information on this uh, on this virus. Basically, uh, it's a coronavirus. Corona in Latin means crown, so it is like a it is like a crown. I don't know like whether we have to be have we have to be happy or not. It is either like a coronavirus. Single standard positive sense of RNA, smart, very smart because of. So it basically doesn't uh, doesn't uh, like uh, require any translation. So it is it can just be safe as a positive sense RNA. When required, it can just form a negative sense RNA and start spewing uh, its its molecules. As of now, we have we have seen four groups of SARS-CoV-2, four groups: alpha, beta, gamma, and delta. And as I just color coded them, alpha and beta are the ones which are usually they cause uh, disease in human. Technically, theoretically. These are basically not human viruses. These are actually animal viruses. Only thing is when we disturb their habitat, when they are the, the host habitat, then basically like obviously these viruses are undergoing constant evolution. So one of the, one of the like, like a mutant 
could basically may have a, may have an affinity for one of the human receptors and we are in a wrong place or we are doing the wrong thing hence we get we contract them same thing with sars or mers or right now covid actually this covid with this sars cov2 it has got a mutation in the spike protein it has got a mutation in the spike protein i told you it is an antenna which is going to interact with your interact with your host receptor so when there's a mutation what exactly happened this mutation has justly given more affinity for this virus to attach to the human receptors or pangolin receptor rather than rodents or civets so civets cats hence they are um, they obviously this virus has become a more of a like a human pathogen rather than just just confining itself to rodent rodent or civets so when you look at this like usually bats are probably they are the most on the they are the origin of most of this like a uh, uh, coronavirus or most of the viruses with the several intermediate host you know very well that as virus evolve basically like their receptors receptors like affinity changes so when they come across some intermediate versus a host with a complementary receptor they just bind with them it's a it's a natural process of evolution so for 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 example for mers mers virus camel is an intermediate for sars virus civet uh, cat is an intermediate similarly for sars pangolin is intermediate so when you either contact come in contact with the mucus of the um, animal an intermediate host or just you like eat them like so close contact then obviously the final host human host basically they just get exposed and they get they get uh, infected by the animal as far as this covid is concerned pretty much it seeds falls of it follows the same route the bats are the like primary host so either direct like a direct like a handling of uh, uh, like a uh, bat either for food or for medicinal properties or the secondary host that is the pangolin when they are when they are handled for uh, food or medicinal properties i understand that pangolins are supposed are supposed to have a lot of medicinal values in chinese medicine so when the individual is sort of a manipulating this animal like butchering the animal or trying to extract its scales obviously the virus the virus in the animal basically just gets into the air and like when it when it obviously because this virus has got a sort of a like a mutated receptor now it no longer avoids human now it basically embraces human now so very nice very nice hug on human being now fine and human even though we have even though the mobile my cell phone and um, like in cell phone facebook etc as distance ourselves very effective that's a benefits of cell phone that's a benefit of all these like if like a social media they supposed to just help us communicate each other but like the communication is only a distance communication so even even if like four friends just go into a restaurant for a restaurant as of get together moment they go in first minute maybe they say hi hi after that it's all face time they just try to just they like uh, share the restaurant ambience to the friends etc so in a way that is is good it prevents close contact but sometime there is a human human interaction and when there is a human human interaction obviously this virus that is there on human host that get exchanged among individuals most of us don't even realize that there is we have infection because our immune system is very robust so we just basically like we just uh, we either become a symptomatic carriers or we just like take care of the uh, bug very effectively hence nothing happens but some of us if we have underlying uh, underlying conditions then we end up having symptoms and end up in the hospital and this human to human transmission is a one key character that is making this virus a really a challenge because when you just come do a comparison ebola even though it is contagious it has got a very limited spread it has got within 3 feet if you just if you're talking to an ebola patient like maybe like stand 4 feet or 5 feet away there is a less likelihood of you just coming contracting the virus whereas in the case of uh, uh covid i think 6 foot is reasonable we really just don't know whether 6 foot is enough but at least 6 foot distance is good enough for us to just separate them because measles which is among the contagious uh, pathogens measles is one of the highly contagious pathogens but even then it can with 6 feet if you are going to stay away from the measles per patient then there's a less less likelihood of an individual like a contracting the virus so this is the this is i'm just this i'm just going to just like a, like a, i would like to share this because i i believe every one of us agree that we need to just it is it is highly desirable to ban animal markets 
live animal markets that trade especially that trade wildlife i'm not saying like it is a, like we should we should we should like ban live animal markets which uh, like which trade uh, like a uh, like food or like or, or like a fish or something like that which are not wild animals but wild animals i think it is it is a, this covid is a, is giving us a wake up call to just like a uh, remind ourselves that it is time for us to just like a uh, uh, ban the live animal markets stop illegal traffic and poaching of wild animals because it is not only to help us prevent the infection but also it just like help to prevent the extinction of the species um okay let me just like okay let us just like go to the biology of uh, i just given a splish of pandemic then just moved on to be a, the uh, covid 2 now on covid 2 so what exactly so like we we are got the we saw the anatomy of sars cov2 virus next question is like okay what exactly happens how exactly this virus sort of uh, attacks the individual that exact next question and as, as i indicated earlier basically the s protein is a hero as far as the virus is concerned and as far as our our, our like a culprit is the ace inhibitor ace2 inhibitor angiotensin convertin enzyme 2 receptor it has got function it has got a very specific function in in in, in maintaining the fluid balance in, in the system this ace2 inhibitor ace2 receptor ac2 ac2 receptor is actually it is expressed in kidney in lungs and in gi tract these are the, these are the various places where this ace2 receptor is expressed and it, it basically has like a function in fluid balancing in, which is very very important for the metabolism but when a sars virus basically just comes in contact with the ace2 receptor and if the s protein has got a, like a like receptor binding domains that are that can complement that can recognize specific signature regions in ace2 receptors then it can bind and this binding is facilitated by the transmembrane protease this protease basically like a, cleaves the ace2 receptor it's making it making it more amenable for the interaction of the uh, viral protein to the uh, receptor that basically like the, as simple as that once they basically they just join hands as2 receptor and uh, as protein it's a well it's a welcome welcome handshake and the virus basically like say like okay i will send you my i'll send you my guest inside that is genomic rna it is pushed inside and fortunately or unfortunately like with the viral viral like a membrane and the human membrane they are all same they are all very similar there are lipid bilayer hope some of you would immediately would just will will, will uh, remember the beautiful like a fluid mosaic model of uh, danieli and davison like that exactly what it is so they are they are like chemically they are very much homologous so they can just sort of they can merge pushing in the uh, pushing in the viral rna and that that starts the whole process <laughs> let us one quick look just little little like a closer look at what exactly how exactly happens during this the receptor protein interaction i will not take much time just this is to give you a sort of a flavor of what exactly happens where you can just see here that this is exactly a very very interesting very very complex interaction where the when you look at the s protein basically s protein has got various domains and like you have got a receptor binding domain that is highly variable domain like just like your antibody Hope you hope everybody remembers the antibody IgG structure. Basically, it's like IgG has got a like a heavy chain and light chain, and the light chain has got a hyper variable region or the it is that is exactly the uh, region maybe six amino acid or eight amino acid. That is the one that's going to keep just varying. That's why even though we have the capacity to just uh, like identify and differentiate, uh, differentiate and differentially respond to almost like a ten million different antigens. that each each result in the differentiation is that eight amino acid that is exactly that hot spot similarly the the the, the uh, when you look at the s2 and s1 s1 domain basically s1 domain has got that receptor binding domain that has got the variation this variation is the one that's going to bind to ac s2 then what happened the enzyme this uh, like a uh, transmembrane protease that basically cleaves that cleaves the uh, like a ac ac2 because primarily the ac2 is almost like a, like a precursor once truncated once the ac2 is truncated that basically exposes the ac2 ends which is, which can very comfortably bind very comfortably bind to the rbd and once they bind then basically the um, uh, the uh, uh, 
uh, what is that? The uh, the viral membrane that basically says merges with the with the uh, with the host cell membrane. And what is what is different here? One membrane membrane it is it is basically merges and then automatically the RNA is sort of inserted inside. But exactly what happens here, where you can just see here, this is a very interesting head-to-head -head comparison of SARS, COVID, like a MERS and a SARS, very, very identical, very identical. Only thing is when you compare the MERS receptor and the SARS receptor, you can just see here the SARS, SARS S proteins have got much higher affinity for receptor AC2, hence they become, that's the reason why it is a, it is a really a, a really pandemic that is really like uh, hurting the human member of a population right now. So getting back to the biology of uh, like a SARS-CoV, you could just see here very clearly, this binds, then the membrane, membranes are merges, then obviously you have an endosome, like a, like a membrane, a membrane like a covered uh, a virus that has been sort of a, like it is engulfed. After, after the engulfment, obviously the viral RNA is like pushed out. Remember, it is, is it a positive sense RNA? So what exactly happens? The first enzyme that has been transmitted, the first what exactly happens is it is translated. And the after translation, the replicase is the first enzyme that has been transcribed, that is uh, uh, translated. So once replicase the enzyme is produced, then this replicase that basically transcribes and basically what exactly happens is yeah, sort of a copy of the genomic RNA is formed. So you have a genomic RNA, a negative sense RNA, and negative sense RNA is pretty much like a like a like a virus. So it has got like a, it has it has got the transcription regulatory factors. So it has got transcription regulation sequence. So it can start initiate the transcription. Hence, all all the required like membrane protein, S yes protein, like envelope protein, all of them are actually they have been like transcribed here. And of course, our endoplasmic reticulum. Yeah, host enterprise reticulum, it's a very nice host. It doesn't, it doesn't say no to anybody. So it doesn't say no to the RNA, but like a viral, viral uh, transcriptomes. So it, it takes in everything, transcribe them, prepare the respective proteins and wonderful. So virus says, thank you. I will just once again, will assemble the virions. And after all, like lipid, lipid by um, bilayer, just buds out one complete cycle. So our host becomes a sort of a, like a factory for the production of more virions, wonderful. It all goes out. This is this is just give you give, gives you a flavor of the interaction. How exhaustive, even though it looks very simple, even though it very still looks very simple, just like a six proteins of a six or six or so viral proteins. But still, you can just see this has got almost like a hundred. This the viral entry, transcription, translation, and the exit. It involves almost 200 different proteins, almost like 150 different interactions, where the green ones are, are basically viral viral components, and the on the square or square box actually you use those component. You can just see how complex is the interaction. But at the end of the day, what happens? Like virus is very happy, more virions are formed, more virions just they just get bud out, and they just they just go to the next cells. Where well, as long as cells have got AC AC2 inhibitor, AC2 receptors, virus is happy. But okay, we are not dumb. We are smart. That's the reason why human race has survived. Even even when like uh, when uh, diagnosis are just like uh, the disease, when they just cease to exist, we were able to exist, and we will continue to exist. Uh, no question about it. So we are the, we are certainly we are the human race is the smartest of a uh, well evolved human race of the living being. So we have our own strategy. You know very well. Anybody biochemistry, microbiology, or molecular biology, when anybody has studied my basic immunology, you know very well that once once this happens, whether it is the lung epithelium or gut epithelium, then obviously there are you, we have scavengers. We have if it is going to be gut, you have got like you've got you have got like a circulating macrophages. If it is a lung, lung you've got alveolar alveolar uh, like a macrophages circulating there. They scavenge it. They just engulf it. They just like digest it, and this then basically basically what exactly happened is like they just like like a uh, with the help of MHC1 and 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 uh, with, and they trigger the production of a uh, very 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 effective uh, range of interleukins. Wonderful. So this recruits macrophage. It, it, it recruits T T cells and like usually CD8 cells. Then they just come. They effectively they just like uh, destroy the viral or viral cells. So virus is cleared. We are all happy. But 
That's the reason why almost 80% of the individuals, either they, know, they, they, are, either they are asymptomatic or basically they may have a milder symptoms, they go off, no problem, no problem at all. But unfortunately, there are factors like age, smoking, diabetes, if you are on immune suppression. These are all basically like, so Tamil Nadu Tamil Yana Tan Talile Manna Amari. Unfortunately, these are all factors, but basically like predisposes the individual because this is going to basically trigger uh, in, pro inflammatory uh, cytokines. These cytokines are supposed to be good for us, but unfortunately, they lead to hyperinflammation. So more, more immune cells, they just like a mount a sort of a disproportionate immune response. In the, for example, the lungs, they're going to just mount a disproportionate immune response. Like for example, IL-1 beta or IL-6, that is really just going to just make, for example, one of the common, one of the most common uh, like a consequence of this hyperimmune response is a production of a compound called hyaluronic acid. This hyaluronic acid basically is technically, it is good whenever there's a tissue damage, like just, just like putting a bone oil or a bone oil or a, like ointment, this is basically a gel, it's a jelly that basically just seals the um, wound, helping the whole system to work like a heal, tissue to heal. But unfortunately, when there is a sort of a sort of a like a cytokine storm, as it is mentioned here, you are going to have tons of like cytokines there, and there is going to be a like what exactly happens? One mechanism, one consequence is it triggers the production of hyaluronic acid. When hyaluronic acid is produced, it is like a gel. Your lungs are supposed to be like a sponge, a dry sponge. Imagine it just lung. Normal lung la the kajuno liquid and all like a pneumonia. That is itself is a problem. But imagine just throwing in a sort of a jelly there, then you are obviously your lungs cannot perform their function. There is no gas exchange. That means the individual is struggling to just struggling to breathe. That's where you, you the individual goes to hospital and he's been intubated and basically like it it, it reads to other com complications. So what? So either either you just you don't have any you don't have any symptom. You may have a milder symptom and you, you just you'll be you'll be fine or you may have a serious symptoms that may just lead you to hospitalized and special care. So what can, what exactly are the consequences of this like COVID-19? It could be systemic, systemic. It can just basically, it could be a fever, cough, fatigue, headache, and possible that any one of the stages, you may just have, a, you, may just, you, you may just have a fever for some time, that, that you'll be fine. Or it can just slowly, it can, it can, it can descend into a more complications. Like, like a bloody cough or cardiac injury, or like, like, like a, it can also affect your GI like tract because you know very well that GI tract also just carries this ACE2 receptor. But what exactly is life threatening in the respiratory dis disorders? Where basically, like pneumonia and uh, like acute respiratory AD, ARDS, that's a, that's a really a, a serious complication because ARDS happens when the entire system shuts down. Because obviously there is a respiratory distress. There's not much enough oxygen. So obviously brain says, hey, I'm not getting enough oxygen. If I'm going to function, I'm going to just like kill myself. So I would rather shut down. When brain shuts down, the entire system shuts down. So the individual has to be in a complete right so life support. The problem why COVID is actually is a real problem. It is because of the transmission rate. On one hand, it is like sometimes it can overwhelm the immune system. Sometime it can basically, our immune system can overreact. But on the other hand, that, that's a one complication. But on the other side, in the public health point of view, the transmission rate, which is also expressed as or not, or a pre-production number or, or not, that is the index which, which, which will tell, which tells us whether this infection is going to be contagious or not. If or not is less than one, usually this is, disease will disappear automatically. It is not contagious, which will be fine. But if it is or not is more than one, greater than one, then it is contagious. You may just the moment you see this is like, hey, what a big deal. There is not much difference between flu and uh, COVID. The or not is very, very similar. But unfortunately, if you remember a few previous slide, this virus has a tendency of staying in air or remain viable in air or in inanimate objects is much longer than flu. That's the reason why when flu has got an actual incubation period of one to four days, this can just have a longer incubation period. 
of like one to 14 days. So obviously, even though it, it is contagious, it is the R naught is comparable to flu, but because of its persistence for a longer time, it can be, it can create a havoc. And that's exactly what we are seeing right now, where it is persisting and it is, it is slowly, it is just spreading off across the globe. So, okay, we know, we know, what, we, know we, we know the culprit and we know how exactly we are, our, our system reacts and we know exactly, okay, it is not, there is always a possibility that we would just come down to the disease. And that's exactly what we are seeing. A global burden of COVID is certainly, it is, it is real and it is growing. How are we going to just handle it? First of all, we need to know whether there is really COVID or not. Individual, an individual comes with a cough or fever or muscle ache, we want to know whether it is COVID or not. So we need a diagnostics. There are almost 41 different diagnostics and it's growing. It's available now in different countries. We also need to have some specific treatment strategies. Okay, I've diagnosed it. I cannot just like wash my hands saying like, oh, like just like flu, uh, treated from, uh, for, from a cold loss for seven days, untreated cold loss for uh, one week, no big deal. Go home, you have no rest. No, that's not the case here. Got to be just, got to be proactive, got to do something tangent, something very, very clear. Because we just, we, this basically is not going. These patients require help. And obviously, given the pandemic nature of this, uh, of this bug, we need to have a vaccine. So that's vaccine trials are also in progress. Diagnostics, I am just confining myself only to the like molecular diagnostics of the virus. I'm not just like this does not include any zero diagnosis because like it is still it is premature. Even, even, even though we have one uh, like a uh, like an antibody kit that has been approved recently, but even that is quite a little bit controversial because apparently there are more false negatives than that. So I'm not going there. But, but we do have we do have very effective solid molecular molecular diagnostic kits that can actually detect and uh, detect the virus and like uh, and establish that whether it is a covid or not so like like it, the time only thing is the result time can range from like a few days to just one, like one hour for example you have one kit that has that uses the lamp technology i'm pretty sure those who are teaching molecular biology or virology or medical microbiology would, would, would be able to come immediately connect with the lamp technique, like which is isothermal amplification, which does not, unlike uh, like a traditional PCR where near, there need to be three different temperatures. No, it doesn't happen like that. It's a single temperature. Only thing is, it is like, it has got its own limitations. Let us not go there. But yeah, we do have iso lamp based uh, technology. Hence, we can detect, we can detect the virus from the uh, clinical specimen, just the nasal swab very effectively. Now we don't even need a nasal swab. We don't even need to go deeper into nasal swab. Just a, just a, just a, like, a, uh, like a localized swab is good enough. Um, treatment, obviously the primary goal is the anti-inflammatory because like we know very well that that is the culprit. That is the inflammation is the one that can actually, that is going to push the scale on one way or other. Because if we can see, you need to understand that this is the disease or the immune immune response. Everything is a number game, basically. You have a, you have like a set number of pathogen. You have the set number of immune immune response. If there is going to be a balance, we survive. If there is going to be imbalance, then one of one of us are going to suffer. So in this case, hyper hyper like like hyper, like uh, hyper inflammation is a real cause. So if we can contain the inflammation with anti-inflammatories, then what I would say, that gives a host a good fighting chance to get over this pathogen. That's exactly what we are doing. So there is a range of anti-inflammatories available that, that exactly are, are being used in the treatment. Primarily, of course, make sure the individual alleviate the symptoms so that like they are comfortable. And we do have some antivirals that's being actively being, uh, being considered now. One popular, this is a one popular like a um, uh, like, uh, uh, treatment uh, therapeutics that's been actively considered, which is very controversial, like because like it is it is very old. Chloroquine is well known, like I'm pretty sure people in India know very well about chloroquine because every one of us would have just taken chloroquine in, in our lifetime or like, once or twice or multiple times, because this is basically prescribed for malaria. And it is, a, it is as old as 1934, it is, Quite a quite a old medication, but it is supposed to be like chloroquine has supposed to have a 
some benefit, beneficial impact either on one hand, one hand on the virus. It basically, well, chloroquine can actually can alter the pH. It's been shown to alter the endosomal pH. By altering the endosomal pH, it actually, it can interfere both the fusion of the virus and then for a subsequent, a subsequent transcription and budding. It can basically, it can interfere, interrupt the entire viral, uh, viral life cycle in the, in the host. And also, chloroquine also seems to have an impact on the tumor necrosis factor production, which you know very well, like one of the major problem, one of the major etiological reason for this, uh, for this uh, COVID is the uh, hyper, hyper, you know, hyper inflammatory response where TNF can very well can activate or support the uh, hyper inflammatory response. So if chloroquine is going to diminish the or interfere or diminish the tumor ne ne necrosis factor production, then obviously it is going to have a linear relationship with the benefit. It is beneficial on paper, but like still like uh, it's, it's very, it's still it is too premature to really just say whether chloroquine is good or bad. And that's the reason why it is not technically, uh, clinically it is recommended as a therapeutic for uh, COVID, even though people do just like a run around, try to just take chloroquine. Please, it is not a clinically proven to have a, a benefit in the COVID. On the other hand, this is a, this is a class of drug that has been recognized as, anti, as a medication or therapeutic effective against COVID. Remdesivir, actually it is a nuclear a nucleotide analog and uh, like adenosine analog. And uh, it is earlier, it was found to be very effective for Ebola and then some other single stranded viruses like RSV. And now it is known, now it has been shown very clearly that it is effective at COVID. That's the reason why it is becoming a frontline, like a treatment, a treatment strategy for people who are really just uh, coming down with uh, COVID, uh, the coronavirus. It is, adeno, it is adenosine nucleotide, nucleotide analog. It is a sort of a precursor or a sort of a, it is an inactive form. Once it is ingested, then it undergoes like a conversion, and then basically it it blocks the viral uh, viral replication. So it is it is now being recommended. It is being being recommended as a therapeutic for uh, COVID. Uh, there is another another neutralizing antibody that is Kevzara. It is actually a, as you know, IL six is basically one of the one of the major. Uh, pro-inflammatory cytokine. So this is a neutralizing antibody that can go and bind to the receptors, making the IL-6 less reactive. Hence, obviously, that's going to be, uh, that there is a good chance of giving the, giving the uh, host a much more a fighting chance against this virus. Vaccines, yeah, there are a lot of activities going on in the vaccine, uh, vaccine, uh, uh, vaccine uh, like uh, uh, scenario. Uh, several vaccines, several types of vaccines. Moderna, Moderna, I suppose, I think this is a RNA virus, very, 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 very simple, like, uh, uh, strategy, because we know very well, for example, we know very well that the receptor binding domain, the variable receptor binding domain, the domains that we know are the immunodominant domains that is expressed by the, by, by the uh, virus. So that domain, you just truncate that particular sequence, then plug it into the mRNA, now and, and pack this mRNA, then pack the mRNA into into a into a sort of a vector. Then basically like shoot, shoot that into the individual. So it's not going to get a disease, but the mRNA is the mRNA is going to just get transcribed, produce more. It's almost like becoming a sort of a small like a factory. Keep producing more of those immune dominant uh, proteins, S proteins, those particular signature immune dominant signature uh, sequence. So it basically triggers the immune response. Wonderful! You are having a, you are, you are getting a constant priming of immune response. So when you have, when you get the real COVID, when you get the SARS infection, you are already, you are already pre-warned. You are already primed for it. Bang! You are gone. So the virus is taken care. Of. So that's that's been very actively pursued. It's it's being it's very promising. A apart from that, there is a DNA vaccine available. Some of them, like for example, even almost like an attenuated vaccine is available. Um, so there are a lot of strategies going on. Uh, we will know, like as as we get more information about the uh, uh, vaccine uh, vaccine trials, we will know exactly which vaccine stands because the vaccine vaccine trials basically, like it may it may just cross phase one. That is, phase one is actually for safety, but it may not cross phase two, or it may not, it may just fail in phase three, which 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 examines the vaccine efficacy and safety in a different population. So hopefully we will have. 
some positive uh, some positive news in the viral in the vaccine uh, uh, vaccine scenario where we just get the vaccine at the end of the year or so but like we don't know it is too early to uh, like uh, guess which one is going to be good or which is going to be available so of course at the at the all said and done at the end of the day like it, everything starts with us so prevention is better than cure and that is true as far as covid is concerned so wear a mask that's very very important whether you have a cough or not it doesn't matter just wear a mask so that like at least it will actually will even though you know like microbiologists would say her huh, really you you want me to wear a mask the regular mask i'm not i'm not going to wear a n95 if it, if it is not a n95 then obviously it's not going to be, it's not going to just sort of a block the virus virus is going to be there i can i will be near in the virus but a hey, you want this will block the droplets like a bigger droplets bigger droplets will have a higher rate suppose the bigger droplets are housing more back viral load you are going to block the block the like uh, droplets thereby like a uh, like uh, indirectly we are going to block the viral load so instead of inhaling 1000 viral particles now we are going to inhale only over 10000 viral particles as i told you it's a number game you are trying to just make things advantages for you that's exactly what it is hand wash avoid touching your face these are all basics i'm pretty sure you have just heard about it in fact like google just says same thing like keeps keeps uh, like stay safe stay home keep a safe distance six foot i see like they are keeping wonderful distance i was watching a tv at tv they study or they paper study because like they have uh, opened up the uh, life uh, like a life supply of uh, life supply like life uh, elixir to the individuals tasmak right they opened it up and uh, wow what a safe distance they are keeping that's great <laughs> anyway but hey i'm not, i don't want to paint a very 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 like a very gloomy picture because as i told you we are very resilient human race is extremely resilient we have come overcome several challenges we will certainly overcome covid it's really with the remdesivir now being like a, being found to be very effective treatment that gives a lot of confidence that okay even if i want to come come down with uh, covid if it is if you please go if i might if i'm going to be in high risk i have something to just fall back so we will overcome this no question at all but let us make sure that all the information right now all the power of knowledge what we have let us try to just like use it to predict try to have a better modeling see see the evolution is a constant process and basically based on that based on the knowledge what we have on the ongoing evolution and un the host host receptor etc let us see if it is possible for us to predict maybe we can basically, basically we can reverse engineer so we can just we can see whether all the epidemics that have happened in the recent past is this is it is it possible for us to reverse engineer and see what exactly is happening is it possible for us to to create a model so that that model can be used on a on, on, on to uh, to predict the uh, you know futuristic uh, pandemics so so that we can try to just learn and outsmart the evolution but my closing remark is as a scientist as a faculty we have responsibility please this is a one thing that is really hurting the covid uh, covid covid uh, like uh, covid control and the and the public health uh, the system is forwarding and exchanging messages without really just fact checking them in the social media india indians are indians are resistant to covid or like or like uh, some uh, um chennai la vandu veil bayangaram adik kathiri veil vandaachu so we are fine please if we are going to say that then that's going to just like a, like like that's going to be give a false comfort and false assurance to a common man so any any forwarding of this message any message please cross check please fact check and tell people please take time to just tell people because every educated individual whether it, whether it is your microbiologist or biotechnologist as a faculty as a student of science we i believe have got a moral obligation to just provide the actual like a facts to the individual even though they may not like it say like hey tamil nadu open panni vittaangale tamil nadu open panni vittaanga but that doesn't mean we can just happily just move around and just like walk around with um, abandoning the uh, social distancing etc explain to people so that like we can handle this like a pandemic in a much responsible and much efficient way thanks for your time i don't know whether i have taken a lot of time but thanks for your time and uh, 
I'll be very happy to just uh, take any questions. Back to you, Vidya. Thank you, sir. Thank you very, very much. We were completely spellbound listening to your talk. Uh, there are a lot of questions being posted, sir. The first question is from uh, Dr. M. Reena. Uh, sir, I have a basic information to get clarified with regard to COVID infection. Do T cells and T dependent B cells play a major role? If B cells also play a role, then antigen is getting recognized, then why is less amount of antibody produced? And are the memory cells produced enough? This is the question, sir. Um I'm I'm not sure what exactly this uh, like great question, Rina. It's a very very great. Uh, I'm pretty sure you are actually you are reflecting the questions of, of that is lingering in many people's mind. Actually, people who have been teaching immunology or microbiology, I'm pretty sure that's exactly lingering in their mind. Uh, yes, being a viral infection, T cells and B cells, both of them are going to participate. No question about it. It is too it is too early to say whether the like uh, antibody response is not robust. Or the uh, like, it is not quantitatively and qualitatively robust or not. It is still a lot of it, that, like we don't have any zero diagnostics as of now. Only serological techniques are only now they are just being like cleared by FDA. So a lot of lot of uh, like a trials or clinical trials are going on to understand the quantity and quality and robustness and longevity of this immune response to uh, SARS-CoV-2. So we are not sure. Hopefully, we are hoping. They're hoping that the SARS-CoV-2, because it is having a very strong, those uh, the, those uh, S protein receptors are immunodominant. We are hoping that that the response is very robust. The quality of the uh, antibodies are very good. They are very strong neutralizing antibodies. Hence, like we will uh, we will not have uh, uh, recurrent infections. There were there were there were like uh, there were like in, uh, like uh, instances where they, there are reports even in China, Wuhan city where People who have, who have been sort of infected by uh, COVID once, they also came came down with COVID, COVID, but that's only and like a, not even 0.01001 percent population. So there could be so many other underlying conditions. Hence, it is premature. I hear you. I really strongly hope that the immune response or the antibody response that is mounted is quite robust, quite strong, so that either number one. We can use it for our for 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 a passive protection for really sick people. We can just use use it. Then that also can just encourage the development of monoclonal antibody, which can be used for therapeutic functions. And number two, that also will encourage the vaccine the vaccine manufacturer because if the immune response is very very weak, then that certainly would be discouraging for the vaccine manufacturing. So on all three counts, I really hope. I hope you also share my. Uh, uh, share my uh, like a uh, like a uh, optimism. Thanks for the question, Reena. Another question from YouTube live chat, sir. Bhagavati Shivatan has posted this: In COVID nineteen infection, death is due to multi organ failure or only the respiratory system. If it is, what are the other affected? Sir? It is. It is actually respiratory failure is the main thing. Respiratory failure is the main thing. But usually, when the respiratory failure where the system fails, it invariably it leads to ARDS. So, respiratory system failure is the main cause of death. But very, very often, that leads to ARDS. That actually sort of it cements the case. There is no, there is very difficult to reverse the situation. So, you are you are right. I think respiratory failure is the main thing. Uh, one more question, sir. Uh, how to identify asymptomatic patient? Why there is a reinfection? Uh, this is from uh, Dr. Vidya Chennai. Not sure. Asymptomatic. It is like it is. It is asymptomatic, unless unless we have a we, we have a reason. Unless basically like uh, they were they have they have con come in contact with the with the COVID positive individual. So basically, like we suspect that it is possible that they they could they could be carriers. Then we may have to just like we have to we have to just like a diet. We have to just test them for COVID, or else. There is no way unless and until that becomes mandatory that everybody need to undergo testing. It is, we have no way to say what, how exactly, whether an individual is carrying COVID or not, if there is no symptom. So as, as far as asymptomatic is concerned, either they basically, they like, oh man, maybe you know, COVID positive. 
மேபி எனக்கு இருக்குமோ ஐ டோன்ட் நோ ஐ எம் ஃபைன் சரி இப்போ எதுக்கு சொல்லுது எதுக்கும் செக் பண்ணிக்கிறேன் நான் வீட்டில் வந்து வயசான அப்பா அம்மா இருக்காங்க நான் செக் பண்ணிக்கிறேன் அப்படி அவங்களே பண்ணால் தான் உண்டு வேறு வழி கிடையாது and as far as the uh, like antibody question is concerned i just answered that uh, hopefully we will have a much robust immune immune response so that the antibody will be able to protect uh, so one question is from vidya tarni coimbatore uh, can you sir can you explain about covid 19 disease in correlation with kawasaki disease among children uh, i'm i'm uh, i'm sorry it's it that's a great question uh, i i think uh, i may not be able to just like give you the right answer because like uh, i am not a really a clinician so i am sorry uh, like uh, uh, vidya okay. my apologies <laughs> so one more question from usha sri raghavendra uh, as the virus is undergoing high rate of mutation what is the efficacy of antiviral tried so far and is there any change in the incubation period for covid in the 19 mutated strains as of as of now fortunately or unfortunately fortunately the mutation has not impacted the pathogenesis that's what the published like when you look at the published like uh, uh, published in uh, data that shows even though there are mutations it has not had a big uh, it has not directly impacted the pathogenesis either the incubation period or the or the or the uh, disease uh, severity the mutation has not really just impacted that's the reason why the vaccine manufacturers are encouraged to just continue with their vaccine uh, uh, vaccine like uh, uh, vaccine quest for this uh, for this pathogen so the mutations are happening only thing is they have not as of now they have not uh, like impacted the pathogenesis incubation period or the severity of the disease there are a lot of speculations going on i am speaking based on the published information as you have seen in my uh, seen in my talk all information what i am what i have tried to just like base my in uh, i just base my uh, in, uh, like information be, uh, like on a facts on published peer reviewed published materials and uh, it's from okay let's see maggi is the stem cell any way effective in treating the covid 19 patients stem cells um uh, yeah they are Uh, apparently like there's one other one approach is there like trying to just use stem cell to basically like uh, uh, contain the hyperinflammation but to me it is like almost like uh, you know enough enough soldier chumma on the chinna chinna punnu ku vandu periya hammer chadikira mari enna enna enak no i'm i'm trying to get the right analogy but like uh, uh, so it is it is a, it is a possibility okay uh, like stem cell the therapy is, is always there that 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 may be very helpful to just like uh, contain the inflammation or tame the inflammation but i don't i don't think we are that is required actually with in the case of with the remdesivir being um, being sort of found to be very effective as a therapeutic um, i think that's too much of a stretch Uh, the last question sir uh, from veena gayatri krishna uh, sir can there be any uh, side effects of the malarial drug taken during treatment that's oh yeah of, uh, oh that's that's the reason why like, like like there is lot of controversy going on as it, it can impact your systemic uh, it can impact your cardiovascular system that's a one, one of the major uh, like uh, like uh, expected side effect so that is the reason, uh, number one that's a side effect and that on one hand chloroquine on it is not been doc- it has been it has theoretically as if based on the cartoons what i showed you based on the anti anti viral like wave efficacy or uh, hypothetical anti viral efficacy or like a uh, anti like a uh, uh, like uh, anti inflammatory efficacy uh, chloroquine supposed to be have a effect on several viruses but when it comes to the actual like uh, trials it they just fell apart so number one this is not documented number 2 it is it is we have, we have we have shown that like it, there is a possibility of it is having some cardiac effect it can impact your cardiovascular system number 3 all said and done chloroquine is a great drug it is a great drug not only for malaria because it is having some sort of, sort of immune modulation effect it is also used in some of the autoimmune diseases so by taking this drug using it for something which is which we don't know we are actually we are not only we are we are, we are actually putting the risk In, 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 in putting the individual the covid individual the risk of unwanted side effect number 2 but on the other hand you are actually denying 
the actual benefit of the uh, target patients. That's the reason why it has, we have to be very, very careful when you're trying to rush in for chloroquine. Yeah, but it is having it is having its own side of it. That's one. That's the reason why the medical medical fraternity is really sort of uh, be a, sort of a cautioning the individuals to be very, very cautious of that. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, it was very nice. It was very informative, and uh, all the answers were also very nice. Sir. Uh, the questions uh, were being correctly answered, and uh, we, we had a really nice time having this session. So thank you very much. My pleasure. So stay safe. Try to just be try to try, try to be just exert your responsibility because we have obligation. So make sure when you forward things in the WhatsApp or of, of WhatsApp etc. Just like cross check fact check before forwarding them. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank, thank you, you thank you participants. Uh, sorry, there was a technical issue at the uh, beginning of the session. So when all the things come together, so there's uh, traffic in the platform. So uh, we acknowledge that. And uh, tomorrow the login time is again at five o'clock. Uh, those who could not log in through Zoom platform can uh, check out with the YouTube uh, URL which will be mailed uh, after I start the session. Everybody will receive the e certificate after one month of the session is over. Thank you very much. Uh, good evening.